afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our IPR colloquium. I, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Steve Franconeri, our speaker today. Um, Steve is a professor of psychology at Northwestern, and he's also the director of the Northwestern Cognitive Science Program. His undergraduate training was in computer science and cognitive science at Rutgers, and this was followed by a PhD in experimental psychology at Harvard and a postdoc at the University of British Columbia. Um, Steve directs the Visual Thinking Laboratory and does fantastic research on visual thinking, visual communication, and the psychology of data visualization. So he and his team asked some really great questions about what the power and limits are of your visual system and how to design and teach better approaches to help students and scientists understand and use visual representations across multiple modalities. Steve's work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Department of Education, and the Department of Defense and he's received an NSF Career Award and the Psych Psychonomic Society Early Career Award for his research. So please join me in welcoming Steve for his first ever IPR colloquium today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith. Um, I'm excited about working more with folks at IPR and collaborating with you all. So I'm, I'm shocked that it's taken me 16 years to get into this room or so, but I'm glad that it's happening today. Um, I'm Steve. I work on the visual system in general. Uh, my work is rapidly moving into reasoning. So we're going to talk today about just some, some work that we've been doing and that the field's been doing on data visualization. How do you leverage the human visual system in a way that lets you analyze data efficiently and communicate it to other people efficiently? Um, and then how do we get them to reason about it efficiently? Here's a little bit of my history. This is what I studied in grad school. So when I was a PhD student, I worked in a lab where we studied vision for the art, the natural world, faces, scenes, objects, etc. And this is typically what people work on in vision. Um, I have shifted to work on vision in these new weird worlds where we take this visual system that evolved and typically develops to process scenes and faces and berries and such. And we're now using it to shove a bunch of numbers from an Excel sheet into a fake picture so that we can use our visual system on that picture to do stats back on the numbers in the Excel sheet. So uh, we spend a lot of our time staring at these kinds of visualizations and all these other types of maps, graphs, and diagrams. These are all leveraging the power of the visual system to take more abstract ideas, quantitative values, qualitative relationships, and throw them into maps, graphs, and diagrams that we can now parse with our visual system. So this is where I work now. I go back to the Vision Sciences Conference once a year, and they, they used to look at me funny. You know, this is, he's the guy who studies the, the squares and the colored circles and stuff like that. But I've, con I've converted a lot of them into no thinking that this is a worthwhile problem because uh, we spend so much of our time staring at these kinds of displays. So uh, when we look at this image, uh, I, wanna, I wanna tell you a quick story today about how your visual system has two main ways that it processes visualizations, a fast way and a slow way. The fast way is that you can pull statistics out of this image really quickly. When you look at this, you can tell me that there's about, I don't know, 15 or 16 circles. There's blue ones and there's red ones. There's more red ones than blue ones. The blue ones are systematically larger than the red ones, et cetera. So you can pull statistics out of this image like you would in the natural world. I can tell how many people are here, how many lights are on the screen, what color the carpet is, et cetera, using that same system now to pull statistics out of data. And when we do this, we can pull statistics out of data across many visual channels. This is just gonna be like the two minute introduction to visualization theory. You can pull statistics out of position channels. You can code data in horizontal or vertical position. And you can now pick out, let's say, the center of that cloud. Where's the mean? You could get it immediately. Which one of these is not like the other? You could pull it out immediately. This trend goes up as the dots go to the right. You can pull that out immediately. There's two clusters here, et cetera. So these are four different types of stats you might pull from this position coded data. But you have other kinds of channels in your visual system that you can also use to do the same kinds of statistics. What's the mean color here? I don't know, a greenish blue. What's the one item that doesn't look like the others? These get bluer as they go more to the right. There's two colors here, blue and green, and nothing in between. There's a bimodal distribution of the colors, and therefore there must be a bimodal distribution of the underlying data that this picture is representing. We can keep going. You've got other visual channels you can do this for. Orientation. What's the mean angle of all of those oriented lines? Let's pretend this is a wind map somewhere. You could move your hand and be within 10% of the actual answer. We do experiments like this in the lab. Which one of these is not like the other? They're more vertical as they go to the right. There's a bimodal distribution of orientations, vertical and horizontal, nothing in between. You're really quick at making these decisions. We could go on and on. Size is another channel you can do this. Average one's about that big. That one's not like the others. Bigger as they go to the right. 
bimodal distribution, et cetera. So we have a paper down here where we summarize the way that the visual system, because it's built to pull statistics out of the world, we can shove numbers into fake visuals and pull stats out of those in powerful ways. Sometimes biased ways, sometimes ways that are not as accurate as we think, et cetera, and we get into the gory details in that paper, but overall it's really powerful. Here's an example of a real world visualization that actually uses multiple channels. This is the most, one of the more powerful visualizations that you can use to show data in because it's using the position channel horizontally to show uh, GDP per person of different countries. It's using the Y axis to show life expectancy on those different countries. It's using the size channel to show the, uh, the population of these countries and the color channel to show the continent uh, that these countries come from. So this is a really powerful distribution, uh, excuse me, visualization where you can pull stats from all these different channels at once. So you're actually simultaneously uh, inspecting four columns of numbers in your Excel sheet simultaneously. For lay audiences, um, this statistical perception system can actually be really useful. We don't always leverage it. Here is a typical display that people use to depict the possible path of a hurricane. Um, I, 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 I'm tempted to pull the room and ask you what the actual envelope of this thing means. Could I get a wrong answer only? Who has a wrong answer to this? Just so I don't want to embarrass people. No? Okay. Uh, I'll give you the wrong answer. And I, I can tell you this because, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I might have given this answer. Uh, the hurricane is getting bigger. The hurricane's thinning out, right? I don't know. Most lay folks completely misinterpret this, and you can see how that is a life and death big deal to misinterpret this. Uh, here's what it actually means. What they do is they take 100 different models of the hurricane, they generate 10,000 pass each, and then they uh, just they they you know have the mathematical representation of those paths, and then they decide what is the center of that path, and then along each along each distance along that center skeleton, what is the standard deviation? I think it's two standard deviations of uh, all the hurricane paths. And then this is the either one or two standard deviation boundary. Uh, so actually the hurricane, you know, actually there's plenty of hurricanes that are out here, but most people think this is a definitive edge representation. And this is, and it's either just, they can't go outside this region or it's thinning out or it's getting stronger. So what researchers are doing now is uh, showing people just this, just show people the original pass, just plot the actual hurricane pass. And now people can use that natural system that they use to pull statistics from scenes to understand that this is, these are uncertain representations. You have to understand statistical parameters. You have to have taken a stats class to really understand this because it is representing the parameters of a statistical model. Similarly, it, when you go to 538 or New York Times Upshot, you don't typically see election forecasts like this anymore. You did five years ago, you, you certainly did before that, because people have a lot of, you have to have statistical training to be able to understand the actual probability of the blue party winning over the red party. You have to be able to, under, even a lot of people in this room would have to remind themselves that these are standard deviation bars or standard error bars or confidence intervals, what that means. I certainly would have to go and look up the rule again to remember that. So what they're doing now is instead asking people to use their more natural statistical representation. Here's, close your eyes and throw a dart. And, and one of these balloons, whichever one you hit, that's the person that's the president now. That's a much more intuitive representation of statistics. Um, and actually 538 researched the medical risk perception literature and the uncertainty uh, perception literature, including research by uh, Jessica Holman and Matt Kay, who are here in our computer science department. They're the world's experts on this. If you have some, something uncertain to show, they're the two people in the world to go to with that problem. Uh, and they, they built this based on these, these actual diagrams that were present in that literature. Uh, and this worked because they got burned the, the election before. People would see things like this, or they just see uh, probability representations like blue person is 80% chance of winning and red person's 20. Well, 80 is so much bigger than 20. An army of 80 would defeat an army of 20. Therefore, blue person has 100% chance of winning. And without taking a stats class, that's actually hard to think about. So these representations that leverage that natural statistical system are much more intuitive to lay audiences. There's uh, actually work that just came out of Northwestern that uses this. So this is from folks um, over at the, the STEP Center, uh, Beth Tipton and her recently graduated student, uh, Katie. They uh, realized that uh, folks at school, so principals, administrators, et cetera, were uh, un trying to understand meta-analytic data about the effectiveness of different interventions and courses with displays like these, which are having these same problems. 
And what people tend to do is they make mistakes like, well, these are significant and those are not. So I'll count and I'll say it's three versus two, which is not a good way to do a, even a glance meta-analysis. So what they designed instead was something that looks a lot more like 538's representation. And the idea of this is that you can get more of a sense of the uncertainty, not by plotting error bars, which take a stats class to be able to understand, but by leveraging these more naturalistic statistical perception system. So as a brief summary, that's your statistical system. It's fast, it works in parallel. You can soak up a bunch of objects that are plotted in space in color and size, and then pull out their distributions. And you can take some stats like averages, max, min, outlier really quickly. So that's a fast system. Here's where we run into trouble though. Uh, this is a powerful system for, the, for, for, your, for your visual brain. So if your visual brain is so powerful, why are so many efforts to communicate data and evidence to your visual brain uh, not working so well? Let me give you my favorite example. If you go to the internet and you go to Google and you put in world's worst data visualization or like horrible slide or PowerPoint of death, this is literally what you'll find. Get ready, shield your eyes if you need to, hide your pets, go, there you go. So it hurts, right? Do you, are you interested in, in parsing these data? I use this in class all the time. I've actually done a deep dive on this. This was a real analysis done by the US EPA for some climate change legislation proposed by a couple of senators back in 2008. They wanted uh, the, these the, to know whether uh, coal powered power plants would be economically incentivized after this new tax plan was in, was in place to, uh, to clean up, to clean up their, their act because uh, in the end, this green line is the profitability line and anybody who was polluting effectively would no longer be profitable. So this actual slide was shown, maybe not to US senators, but the staff of US senators didn't go well. Legislation didn't pass for other reasons that are political that you can imagine, but this wasn't helping. Um, and here's the person that made the slide. Um, and when this person looks at the slide, it makes sense to them. And that's the mystery that I wanna solve today is why this person who made the slide thinks it's gonna make sense to other people. So he thinks it does, and then he puts it in front of his boss. She says, you're a smart guy, Carl, this is a great analysis, but we gotta work on the presentation. We gotta do a design overhaul of this thing. So I wanna understand what's going on in his brain where he thought other people would understand this, and then what are the, the research-inspired design rules that'll help him make this more clear to other people. So when we look at this, the big problem is that, yeah, stats are fast. There's a lot of purple, a lot of green. There's nine bars in this, but that's not what really matters here. What really matters is you have to pull out a bunch of relations from this thing. To understand bullet point number two, you need to, I'm just gonna make stuff up now, know that the ratio of purple green, green here is smaller than the ratio of purple to green there. To understand bullet point number three, you need to understand that these two bars cross the line, but this one doesn't. So there's a bunch of particular visual relations that you need to pull out of this graph. And it's really tough for the viewer to figure out what those should be because Relations are slow. Your visual system gives you maybe two or three relations per second between values. And if you don't send people to the right relations in the right order to follow your argument, they're gonna be lost. This is the major reason why visualizations are unclear to the people that didn't, to the, the folks that, that weren't the ones that made them. Let me go back to our visualization where we could pull out stats really quickly. Uh, you should notice that you can pull out the stats. You can say there's a lot of red, there's a lot of blue, there's a few green, et cetera. There's a general trend. It looks like a positive correlation. But think about how many different relationships you could extract from this. Uh, looks like China is a little bit bigger than India. It looks like Indonesia has a slightly higher GDP per person than Bangladesh. Looks like Japan has the highest life expectancy of all the countries in Asia. How many of those sentences could I make? Uh, particularly when we start talking about subsets of data. These two countries are higher than those three. It is a combinatorial explosion. We could calculate it, but the answer is a bajillion or something like that, right? It's just, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's gonna be a, a very large number. And of course, your visual system is not gonna be able to complete uh, that whole set. You're not even be able to get five. A lot of the work that we do in our lab shows that you get one. You get one at a time. And maybe you can pull out two or three of those per second. That's more of like the engineering experimental work that we do in our lab is meant to show that. I'll give you some demos of that in a few minutes. So each, rel each relation is a sentence. Bangladesh has a higher GDP than Indonesia, et cetera. And, the, the, and, and your visual system can compute those sentences and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe half the speed as it takes for you to say them, but it's certainly there is a cost to that. This is the, the, the what, what also can make visualizations interesting 
Here we have the person that leads data visualization at The Economist. Uh, we, we, we collaborate a lot with these data journalists, the people at New York Times Upshot, The Economist, 538, Vox. We, we know their reporters, we work with them. We A-B test their techniques because they are the world's experts at showing data clearly. So we wanna figure out why. So Alex runs uh, data visualization at The Economist. And I, I got excited when I saw his tweet that said so many interesting stories in this chart. And what he means by stories, you may have heard this, this phrase, tell stories with your data, data-driven storytelling, tell, tell data stories, blah, blah, blah. What it means when you actually get into the, to the, to the, the mechanics of it, the cognitive science of it is, there are many different relationships that you could be pulling out in these data right now. And telling a story means guiding your viewer to see the right ones at the right times at the right step in your argument. So in this one, I think you can see that, let me just zoom in so you can see it a little bit better. You can see that there's uh, the, uh, the, the main player in a certain industry, second and third companies and all others. How many sentences could one generate from this scene alone? Well, Alphabet is stable, but the competitors are growing compared to the all other companies. Uh, Netflix has a large market here, but Uber has a larger market here. You get the idea, we could create a huge number of sentences based on this. So that's what he means when he says there's so many stories that can come from this. Why is the visual system limited the number of stories it can pick out at a time? Uh, I'm not gonna get into the engineering and the modeling. Don't worry, I'm just, this is just here to scare you. I just wanna show you, uh, you know, we could geek out about why this happens and the modeling and the engineering side. I'll take you to lunch if you'll put up with me babbling about what all this means at some point. It's, this, is, this is my baby, but I will save that for the moment and just say that the important part is that you get this like one sentence at a time. That's really the core nugget of it. I wanna prove it to you. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, you, you, might, you might not be surprised in a display like this. Look at it, it's so complicated. There's so much going on. There's a lot of words there. Let me get it down to a Petri dish where I can prove to you that pulling out a relation actually costs you cognitive time and you can only get one at a time. Here's the kind of demos that we'll do. This is what we'll do in the lab to test that. Here's the world's simplest heat map. Look at that. We're at hot and now it's cold, okay? So this is representing some data somewhere. Um, so it's hot then cold. And that took you 300, uh, no, this one took you uh, four, 525 milliseconds. Eh, that's to press the key, 450 milliseconds, let's say, just to be safe. And you don't feel it though, because it happens so, that's pretty fast. You only feel it if I ask you to do a bunch and then it'll add up and then you'll feel it. So which one of these is not like the other, go. There and there, I think Morty won that one, very nice. So I think you can feel it. When I ask you to do a bunch in a row, the, the, that 400 milliseconds is now 400 milliseconds times 10, and, you, and your react response time here is gonna be more like three or four seconds. So that's the kind of work we do in the lab to show that that's what's happening. And we'll do a control experiment. Maybe it's that I put things in your periphery, maybe your color vision is bad, no, because that pops out immediately. It's really about the relation per se. So that's, there's a whole nother paper right there, right? Just like proving that it's, that it's the relation per se. And so what's happening is, there's another one, you get the idea. What's happening is there's something really serial that you have to do. You cannot just pay attention to all these relations at once and have them uh, make sense in your head. You have to do something one at a time with these individual relations. And the model that we have in the lab, I won't geek out too much, is that you are actually secretly parsing these one at a time and saying, red is to the right of blue, red is to the right of blue, red is to the left of blue. There's literally little sentences going on in your head. They're not verbal, but your visual system has a sentence-like representation that's flowing through, and that's what slows you down in these cases. I study this problem in our lab because this, these relations, those relations, up-down relations, et cetera, and all those relations are the core of all STEM education. And they're just a cornerstone of science communication, STEM education, et cetera. And there's very few people that actually work on the cognitive science of how these relations are perceived. And so that's a lot of what we do in the lab. Let me show you now with a, uh, another kind of graph. You ready? We have a bar graph, world's simplest bar graph. I'm trying to show you that these relations are costly, even in the Petri dish of the world's simplest graph, a two value graph, one value graph wouldn't make any sense, right? And it's just like a box, but a two value graph is the simplest graph you can have. So that one's a descending trend. Which one of these is not like the others? And I think you can feel that was a little easier, mostly because you're using a little hack where you're looking at kind of the shapes of the triangle. So you're cheating a little bit, but we have ways in the lab of taking and separate the bars. We have ways of, of keeping that hack away from you. But I think you can feel that this is costly. And again, the model that we have in the lab is that what you're actually doing is you're popping through and you're making these little sentences in your head. 
We wanted to prove this to the data visualization community. So I used to spend a lot of time at uh, psychological conferences, vision sciences, psychonomics, et cetera. Now I spend, uh, for the last five years, I spent most of my time at an engineering conference, which has been a trip. It's the I IEEE Viz conference where all the data visualization nerds hang out. So they're my primary community for the last few years. And here's a study that we uh, presented a couple of years ago, just showing this to that community because they kind of knew intuitively that that picking out these kinds of relations can be hard, but we wanted to talk about the underlying engineering of why that happens. Uh, you can also tell that uh, uh, when Christy submitted this paper, reviewer two and three both had comments on the title and had wanted more specificity. And you can tell uh, that this is a post reviewer two. And I can't even say that title. So don't worry about it if you can't either. Let me just tell you what was in the paper. Uh, we have here um, a relation that you have to pick out. Um, Morty runs a uh, test prep school um, and it's a mild conflict of interest, I don't know, but it's a test prep school. Audrey took the same test twice, once before and once after that prep, and look at that, she got worse. Wait a minute, this, this school's a little sketchy. Let's look at more data though. Do more students get better or worse on average? Go. Good. Is this like surprisingly hard though? You start going through and you're saying, worse, better, better. You're gonna to have to say it to yourself. And then you get to the fifth set and then you have to, you've forgotten the first one and you have to kind of take notes. So this is just an example of how those comparisons can start adding up. So one thing that, uh, that, that people do in organizations when they make presentations, if you're a consultant or if you're making a dashboard for, a, for an organization, then you'll typically show just the deltas. And what this allows you to do is now you can use your statistical system on the right. And you can say, well, there's uh, 10 bars here, six on the top, four on the bottom. It's a six to four ratio. And in fact, the average delta is this big. So you can operate over those data really quickly on the right. So this is a, a typical design intervention that'll happen for people more on the analytics side where they're trying to understand uh, the, the deltas in a data, plot them explicitly. So you don't have to use this more capacity limited relational system. Oh yeah, and the actual experimental results, you give people four seconds to make this decision. Here they're basically at chance, and here they're basically at ceiling. So you know, chance would be 50%, 90%. This is crowdsourced data, right? This is like Mechanical Turk. So 90% is the best you ever get because people are always playing with their cat or watching TV or something. But you know, we we replicate it in the lab; it still works. Here's another implication that comes with this: the way that you design your data visualization, the way that you actually lay out the, your graph, same data, can affect the salience of different comparisons, different relations that people can see. And that'll cause them to see, to focus on one relationship or another. I'll give you an example. This is a now famous graph, graph infamous, that came from the, the government in Georgia uh, when they were looking for COVID case counts. And you could see COVID case counts are clearly going down, right? Yeah, now you're looking at the x-axis and now you're wondering what's happening. And yeah, yeah the, the problem, it just gets worse as you keep looking. Don't, don't, just your face is gonna melt if you keep going. Uh, the dates are all out of order. Uh, let's remake it, right? This is better. Let's have the different counties and just organize each one by time. So technically you're showing exactly the same data in both, but you've reorganized, <laughs> That's the, they actually published this. Yes, that is the look on your face. The, uh, technically these are the same data, being honest, you should be able to see the right trends, but clearly there's two different things going on here. This one, you're, you're seeing that something's going down. Uh, you know, if I were to be generous, it is easy to pick out, they've ranked it by which day across all counties is best to worst. So technically this does kind of afford a certain conclusion, I guess, if I'm being generous, but I think we want this one. As you can see, same data, different, different design can have radically different interpretations. So of course in the lab, we wanna take problems like this and distill them down uh, to the, the most basic Petri dish version as possible so that we can try to pull out the rules of how this thing works in your brain. And here you go. So we're gonna of course go down to like a two by two graph. This is the, really the, the one of the more simple types of uh, data that you could still manipulate. And we're gonna go back to those crowd workers and we're gonna ask them, what, what pattern do you see in this graph? How would you caption this graph for somebody who's visually impaired? And they're gonna type something. And what could you do? You could say A beats B overall, A beats B systematically. There's many possible sentences that you could produce from this graph. If you're looking at the last two, you might say, hey, actually, Steve, those are the same sentence. What are you doing? You're trying to trick me here? No, actually, so, so logically, they're right. That's the same sentence, but psychologically, these can be really different. Um, if, I, if I were to say, uh, you know, it was until a couple of years, so let me give an example. Uh, the, the verb net is symmetric in English, right? Someone meet A meets B or B meets A, it doesn't matter. But actually, psychologically, it really matters what order you put it in. So if I said, you know, uh, I only got, to, a couple of years ago, I finally met Jamie. I hadn't met Jamie in so long. It was really an honor to meet Jamie. You're like, oh, that's cool. Famous researcher, that's great. 
well, what if I instead had said, you know, a couple years ago, finally, you know, Jamie met me. You know, you'd be like, you're kind of a jerk, right? There's something wrong with you. So there's, there's a big difference there. And then the same thing happens with these visual relations as well, where you're actually getting something different depending on kind of the order that your visual system inspects them. And that's part of our model as well. Uh, that's my, that's my you know, equivalent example right there. So person on crowdsourcing platform sees that and we say, what do you conclude from this visualization? Please type a sentence. And they'll say, West has overall higher revenue for A and B. We'll say, cool. And then, you know, 10 trials later, they'll see another graph. What do you include from this visualization? And they'll say here, well, company A's revenue is higher overall. I think you're seeing what we're doing secretly. These are the same data, but we've just manipulated the way that it's arranged in the actual graph. And we find that it actually has strong effects on what people see. So depending on the way you organize your data, that will guide your visual system to, to make, usually it's the comparisons of things next to each other. That's, there's a couple of rules, but that's the big one. And that will actually control the way that people pick out these limited number of relations. And so the way you set up your design really matters. And then of course we do other ones like now we'll try stacking them up like this, or we'll try, you know, now you focus on the total, there's other, other manipulations we do, but this is the core one, I think for the current point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something super risky, super risky. You ready? Never have not run this experiment yet. We just designed it. It's running literally tomorrow. It'll take 30 seconds. I'm just curious to see if this will work. Um, if you have an even birth date, please only look here. Cover up that side. It's, don't look on that right side. If you have an odd birthday, so you know, if you're born on June 3rd, you're going to look here, June 2nd, June 3rd, June 2nd, right? Um, you're only going to look there. I'm going to put up a couple graphs. Raise your hand if something, and you don't actually have to hold your hand. Just, 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 just be honest about it. But uh, uh, let me know. Raise your hand if something seems off, something seems fishy. Ready? So here we go. I'm going to wait for two more hands to come up. Okay, everybody hold on. Okay, you can put your hands down, et cetera. Um, the, the point is here that this, it's weird that for this phone, audio and video sucks more battery than audio, right? Okay, this one, wait, how can, how's he doing better with video, right? But the idea is that on this side, you're, people are gonna be more likely to notice that. So this is the same thing in reverse. If, uh, if the, the, compare, the relation that the, the graph design suggests to you and pulls you into is, creates a different sentence, now we wanna see if that can actually affect the way that people think and the way that what, whether they've noticed funny things in their data, et cetera. So what I'm betting is that the folks who are over on this side were more likely to see it and the folks that were over on this side were less likely to see it. Uh, this was totally risky. Let's see what happens. Please raise your hand if you noticed it on this side. Please raise your hand if you noticed it on this side. Whoa, cool. That was some cool pilot data. Thank you. Okay, that has never been run before. That was just a hypothesis. That was awesome. Our undergrad who's running this is gonna flip when they hear about this. Thank you. Okay, so why do people have trouble in communicating data and why do you get overwhelmed so often by other people's data presentations at conferences and papers etc uh, it's because visual relationships are slow you only get one at a time and people who design visualizations don't always plan ahead to make sure that you see the right relation at the right time at the right point in their argument so going back to our, our buddy over here uh, when he's showing his visualization he, he he doesn't believe this he thinks his visualization is super clear and the problem is that when he's looking at this visualization, he sees bullet point number two, and he starts turning knobs in his head and looking at particular items. He knows that bullet point number two is supported by the ratio of this to this and the ratio of that to that. And the, the image in front of him literally changes. When you are paying attention to something, when you're picking out a relation among objects in the world, your, your signal in the back of your head, your picture in the back of your head, your movie screen, it's right there behind the bump. You can touch the bump if you want. It's behind this little bump, this little movie screen back there, literally changes. You can record in macaque monkeys and you can tell that it literally changes. Here's how strongly it changes. How many blueberries are there? What you just did in that count was you went like this. You turned up the gain on blue and your picture in the back of your head looked like this. How many red berries are there? And you're gonna say something like seven. And what you just did in your head is that. You literally, if we we're allowed to record back there, that's what the image of the world looks like for you. So when you're paying attention to different aspects of the world, the world literally changes. And that's what's happening to the expert looking at their own graph. They are seeing it 
fundamentally differently than their audience is. And it is a curse. There's actually a name, it's called the curse of expertise. It causes you to see the world and experience the world differently from your audience. We did another experiment on this. Um, let me see just how good you are at this kind of filtering. Ready, I'm gonna give you a graph. Do you see how, I know it's a little dense, but if your eyes can handle it, you see how there's a bunch of blue X's? and they're only in two quadrants. They're only like this, right? They're, they're a forward slash, not a backslash. There's also blue circles and green circles. Ignore those. All you care about are the X's. Right? So all I want you to do is please take your hand and just go like this. And just you know, to yourself, tell me whether these are a forward slash or maybe they're in the other two quadrants, so they're a backslash. Ready? We're going to try to do it fast. So here's another one. Do it fast. 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 Here's another one, do it fast. Here's another one, do it fast. Cool. Did anyone notice anything funny along the way? Yeah, dinosaur. Did anybody else notice the dinosaur? Okay, so you are filtering so much for the axes that you miss Here's our actual, this is our talk from the uh, database conference last year that you miss the presence of a dinosaur in the scatter plot. That's how seriously you are filtering for just one pattern at a time, you miss this. And uh, if we show the dinosaur for a second, 90% of people miss it. Even if you show it for two and a half seconds, this, all these people still miss it, 60%. And then of course, you know, maybe, I don't know, they're crowd workers, maybe they're playing with their cat, maybe they're watching TV. And so then instead of having them do the filtering, now you just say, hey, just tell me if you see anything funny. And now, you know, most people get it, 75 or 90% of people will get it in that case. Thank you, congrats on being the only person today. But uh, that's how powerfully these filtering systems work. Many of you are familiar with this demo. If you're not, Close your eyes and ears for 20 seconds and then have the person next to you tap you on the shoulder because it's something you should experience and it's similar. Okay, all right, for the rest of, uh, all right, those two. Uh, and I'll give you a shout when it's done. Uh, you're paying attention to the white shirts, which turns up the gain on white. And then a moment later, you don't notice that that has walked into the scene because you're inhibiting the, the, the dark areas of the scene. Okay, everybody can open your ears now. There you go. We'll, we'll send you the links later. Just come, come by, I'll let you know. So that's what's happening when people communicate data. This person has been staring at this thing for so long. And when they read bullet point number two, literally in their brain, this is what happens. And they are now just looking at the purple values and they think that the audience is two. This is the curse of expertise. It's good for being an expert. It's good for getting your job done. Tough for communication to audiences. It's a term that's used in the legal world, the education world, the presentation world, et cetera. We wanted to replicate this phenomenon in the lab. Of course, we want to drag it into the lab and show that people believe that others will see the world in the same way that they do. So this is a study from our PhD student, um, Cindy Schoen and Lisan Van Wilden, who is a collaborator who was actually a data visualization consultant on the side and would run into this problem all the time and said, we need to replicate this in the lab because I've run into too many people that show complicated visualizations and think that everybody's just gonna know what's happening. So here's what you do, you come to the lab and we say, look at this, Hypothetical. look at this mythical European country. Look at those deliciously kind of British sounding party names over there. And these are uh, polling data for the, the election. And uh, we, we care about who's gonna win. Who cares about parties three and four? What we care about is these uh, the blue and the green party up here. Now these two parties, the green party was way ahead, but then they had a debate and the green person couldn't answer a question and instead of giving an answer, they kind of insulted the intelligence of the spouse of the other person, not cool. And you could see how that made their fortunes come together. That was not a good move. Time passes, people get bored of that scandal. And then over here at this next time point, we have uh, another debate. And then the blue person can't answer a question and tries to bring up that stale old scandal that nobody cares about anymore, makes them look weak. You can see their fortunes diverge again. Okay, I've just made you a temporary expert. So we tell this little story. And now I say, wait a minute. Forget I said anything. Wrong experiment. Oh, what am I doing? Never mind. Never mind. Um, forget I said, forget all that stuff. We're going to show you a, a, a clean copy of the graph, took away the annotation. All the lines are in full color. And you know what? I'm going to grab that person out in the hall who definitely didn't hear that story. Can you tell me when they look at this? If I ask them, what's the most salient part of this graph? What's the most interesting thing here? What pops for you? Can you, I'm gonna ask them to circle. Can you simulate what they would circle? Give your best guess. And so you're gonna say, well, they'd clearly do that. You'd circle that. And all of you together in the room and circle that. And look what you're doing. You're focusing on the top two lines. The thing that where you have that story in your head 
and it's screaming and that, no that filter knob is turned up on the top two lines and you can't turn it off. And this is what happens to people. They cannot imagine what it's like to take that naive perspective of somebody seeing this graph for the first time. I see that reviewer two is in the audience. Reviewer two is saying, wait a minute, maybe you're right. I mean, those are the top two lines. Of course, maybe, maybe everybody, of course those are the most salient. That's a, that's a good answer. Okay, fine. Well, we could have shown people this graph. We flip a coin when you come in the lab. We show them this graph. And now we say the third place party gets special funding for the next round of the election. Who cares about top? We, this is where the action's at. Exactly the same story. Oops, wrong experiment, blah, blah, blah. Now you do this. So it's, it's really about the story you heard and your inability to inhibit it. That's the curse of expertise that comes in and forces you to think that other people are gonna see what you see in the world. So when uh, we're trying to help this guy, uh, I'm gonna look to my heroes. These are my data communication heroes. These are the websites we go to all the time, the folks that we try to collaborate with. Uh, Amanda and Kevin run the New York Times Upshot. That's Aaron Williams from the Washington Post. Actually, Netflix just poached him a year ago. He's analyzing your Netflix viewing data now uh, because he was really good at, at doing networks and stuff for Washington Post. Uh, that thing that you were obsessively reloading a couple of years ago, uh, that was designed by Anna we Weidecker at 538. Uh, John Byrne Murdoch is explaining COVID to Europe in general. Oh my gosh, log scales. He has to deal with you COVID data or epidemiological data. You have to communicate log scales because linear scales, people think that the data will go like that and it's actually gonna go like that. So then you put it on a log scale and then everybody's brain melts. That's something that John has to deal with all the time. Um, and then this is our, our buddy from The Economist. And then uh, Sarah Leo is the, now I think they're second in command there. Um, and so these folks do great work how are they gonna communicate data to other people? Uh, if I can give you, I think the most important practical advice in 10 seconds, I would say uh, there's gonna be two changes I'm gonna to make to this. First of all, I'll let you stare at this and time you with my invisible stopwatch to see how long it takes you to, to figure out. Does everything, anything feel fishy here? Everything okay? You're looking at the text. So click, it took you 12 seconds, right? It takes our, one of our, an undergrad here 12 seconds to feel like, yeah, okay, I got it. And that was a long time because there were many, you had to, first of all, look up and down and up and down. And then you had to figure out where's 2008. It's not even on here. 8%, where's that here? 2011, there's tons of looking back and forth and tons of coordinating you have to do. So when you're showing your data, two changes I'm gonna to make to this. I'm gonna take the text and turn it into direct annotations. Don't make people figure out what data pattern supports the text, actually put it next to it. So when I teach this topic to undergrads and PhD students, one of the first things I say is, I see a bullet point over there and a graph stick the bullet point on the graph. Actually just point to it and tell people where you're supposed, where that, what data supports that point. And then the second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint what the image looks like in that back of the head to the person looking at this. To, to, so the, the person who made this, this is what I'm seeing and I'm gonna show you what I'm seeing. So these are the two tips that I would, I would use for your posters, for your talks, for your papers, et cetera. The other thing you can do is in a live audience or if, you're, if you're, uh, one of your students is giving a poster, et cetera, is uh, language and gesture. You, we are all overconfident how much the audience sees what we see. And so you should overdo how much you linguistically describe and gesture at the patterns that are important for the point that you're currently making. If you wanna see a, a master at work on that, you can just type in Hans Rosling, one of my heroes, best stats ever, put that in Google, R-O-S-L-I-N-G, and you'll see him take the world's most complicated stats display. This is the one I showed you at the beginning, and he's gonna make it move. So this is really complicated, four channels of data plus time, yet you'll understand everything because he really masterfully guides you with language and gesture through the patterns you should see that support the conclusions that he's make. One word of warning. You are pointing people towards, towards certain comparisons in data. And this can be used for, for, for evil or for good. Uh, so I'm not taking a position on, on, uh, on, on what, which of the following stories is correct, but I just wanna point out that there's, there's a great New York Times interactive where you can, you can show these data and Obama was president here. And you could say, how would a Democrat see these data? How would a Democrat annotate these data? They would say, look at that, Obama takes office, unemployment goes down, go Obama. So we're annotating and showing and directing people towards this orientation channel where people are seeing a downward slope in unemployment. And then you can hit this button up here and you can see what's the, what's the Republican lens. Um, and they'll say, you know what? Obama promised 8% unemployment. And look at the difference between that goal and where we've been for the last four years. Every pixel there is 5,000 people without a job who can't put food on the table for their family, Obama. 
And that's, that's a big difference that you get in these two. And I hope what you agree is that, you know, given the, the, the dinosaur that we showed before, once you lock into one of these patterns and once you see that, and if other people are annotating that for you, it can powerfully affect what patterns you notice and which ones you don't. Now, which one of these accounts is right? You know, that, that's, that's not an answerable question. It's, it's a perspective question. The point is that you could make a verbal argument where you say under Obama, unemployment fell by X percent. Or you could say under Obama, the uh, goal was this and the goal was not met. Those are two verbal arguments. So I will, you, know, you can decide which one of those verbal arguments you buy. This is the visual equivalent of giving those verbal arguments. And even though technically the underlying data that you're showing is the same, the way that you guide people's visual system to see a particular relation can really be different. Um, and we have, a, we have a paper that we did actually with uh, somebody who writes books for organizations where uh, she, she shows you the similar sorts of tricks that we're prescribing, like show people what you should see and give them a good headline. Long story short, if you really show people what they should see, they're about four times more likely to actually remember and understand that point. And even when they redraw it later, we even coded drawings, they're much more likely to remember the point that you intended them to see. Now, again, that can be used for evil as well. So uh, just to redeem Carl here, I feel bad for Carl. Uh, Carl, there's two classes that if, if you, uh, I, I've, I've created two classes over the last several years to, to teach these sorts of communication skills. And I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in data visualization, cognitive science, uh, data journalism, uh, medical risk perception, like in like three other fields that I could name. So uh, if you're curious, you send your undergrads to psych or cognitive science 345 in the fall where I run a PhD class with Liz Gerber from design. Um, and we have like 35 PhD students in it uh, from across the social sciences and design. And that's psych uh, or cognitive science 460. There's some other numbers. If your student is in like design, you know, then you take it under, under Liz's number, uh, but it's the same class. And we run a joint class with 30, 40 PhD students and talk about how to redesign stuff like this. And there we go. So this would be just to redeem Carl a little bit. We've got a better headline. We've got a reduced color palette. We've got direct annotation. We've got a story that people can read through and see the data that supports it. That's the kind of thing that I would suggest for this one. Now Carl can breathe easy. Okay, so just to summarize again, visual stats, they're, they're fast and parallel, and that can be useful, especially when you're showing uncertainty because it's a natural way to show uncertainty, uh, but visual relationships are slow. And whenever people are showing data to others, they have this curse of expertise where they think that other people are gonna look at the same patterns that they are, pick out the same relationships that they are, and it doesn't typically happen. People are vastly overconfident in how well others see the patterns in their data. So use these annotation and highlighting tricks to show people what you see, what it looks like through your goggles as the expert, be honest about it because it is a powerful technique. And then also language and gesture is a great way to make sure that other people see what you see as well. Um, these are the spectacular lab members uh, whose work I am representing today and the folks that paid for all the things. And I will leave this slide up for questions. Thanks. <laughs>